Today, folks, visits Dillard University in New Orleans. We'll be talking to the university's president, Dr. Samuel Boyce Cook, and we'll get an idea from some of the students on what campus life is like. We'll also share with you some of the extraordinary talent that can be found here. I'm Robin Hinton. Those stories and more today on Folks. Everybody says folks. everyone and welcome to another edition of Folks. Today we are visiting Dillard University in New Orleans, a beautiful campus situated on 62 acres along Gentilly Boulevard. Now, the university's roots go back to 1869. That's the year in which both Strait University and New Orleans University were founded. In 1930, the two institutions merged to form Dillard University. But it wasn't until five years later that Dillard began instruction at its present site. Dillard is a liberal arts co-educational undergraduate college. The faculty number is about 100, student enrollment about 1,200. The president of Dillard University is Dr. Samuel Du Bois Cook, and he shared with us his thoughts on what makes Dillard an attractive institution of higher learning. Well, uh, first of all, we have a, a first-class academic program. I have a strong faculty. We have very good students. We have a University of Scholars program which attracts top flight students. In fact, several years ago, we had a university scholar who turned down 16 or 17 scholarships, mostly to Ivy League school, just to come to Dillard. I think we have, in addition to an attractive uh, academic program, uh, first class faculty and staff and good students, we have a good physical plan, of course, and all these things mesh and, and go together. Uh, you need a, a total environment uh, to have a top flight institution, academically, physically, and, and so forth. But I also think the, the physical or financial stability of Dillard is important too in uh, attracting students and, and being an attractive, uh, attractive institution uh, generally. Uh, we don't brag about it, but we don't have any cash flow problems. We manage our resources well. We receive tremendous support from a variety of sources. Uh, the United Methodist Church, uh, the UNCF uh, from alumni and around uh, foundations. So we get a lot of support. So we have financial stability. We don't have to worry about meeting the payroll and things like that. And all these things are, are important. We don't have any deficits. And that is some achievement for a private, well, almost any college university now, but especially a small private one. In recruiting students, what, what do you look for? Well, we look uh, for students who have a good academic record and display great uh, academic promise, who, who are excellent, who are committed to high standards, who aspire to, to great things, who aim high because this is what it's about, this is what life is about in the end. Uh, what Dr. Mays, my great mentor at Morehouse College, used to call uh, uh, lofty aims and noble goals of striving. We, we, we like for students who want to soar, who got the imagination, who want to be somebody outstanding. But in addition to academic preparation and academic promise, we look for students who have integrity and who have decency. It's not enough to have students who are brilliant. You, you want students who have some character and some decency. After all, not the Germans that had the greatest university in the world. 
uh, but people who separated knowledge from morality and purpose and decency. I ain't know what that happened when, when knowledge, great technological skill is separated from morality and religion and human decency. You open the floodgates to all kinds of evils. So when individuals who have decency, who have uh, uh, high standards of morality, who have character, but we also want students who are committed to social relevance, to human betterment, who want to improve human life, who are committed to the human community, improving the community, who want to make this life better. Uh, and students who are committed to what my class made at Mohawk College, Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community of all God's children. I think that, that is important. Students who are committed to justice. Nothing in this world is more important than justice. We want students that, of that kind. Uh, but we also want students, of course, in the end, who have a zest for life, who enjoy life, who, have, who, who view life in its wholeness and who can affirm life, who are total human beings. Uh, so we want students who are great role models and all those kind of things. How important is financial aid to the students who attend here, and what effect have cutbacks in financial aid had on uh, student enrollment? Uh, to your first question, how important it is, uh, it is of supreme importance. 90% uh, of our students receive financial aid. This is true of U the UNCF schools, in particular, about 90%. So it's uh, of desperate necessity. Black families receive only 57% or so of the white family income. So we, you know, we're way behind that way. Uh, thirdly, uh, our black students, many of them, say 50%, come from families with an income of, say, $12,000. Families not only of four, but families of eight and on up. And obviously they've got to have a lot of financial aid to, to you know, to, to come to school and, and to stay here. So financial aid is, is crucial. It's, it's an imperative. Um, when I, the UNCF did a study not long ago of, of how much these students receive from their families vis-a-vis -vis white students and the difference is astronomical. They can expect so little, you know, from their, from their family in terms of support. Just don't have the money. So that money has to come from someplace. Now you raise the question about the impact of uh, the Reagan administration and so forth had a tremendous impact. Uh, and so many of our schools have lost enrollment in large part because of it. Uh, not only the cutbacks in financial aid, they have been bad enough. But more important than the cutbacks have been the ambiguities and the uncertainties which rob students of the hope and the feeling that they cannot get any money. So the actual cuts have been less significant than the uncertainties about the cuts. But they are of great, great significance. And the president, uh, president's budget now, proposed budget for 1987, uh, proposed a cut, about 10 percent, and financial aid cut out some of the program. In addition to which, the um, so-called Budget Balancing Act, you know, the Graham, Rudman, Hollins Act, and so forth, mandating 4.3 percent cut on March 1st, or 25 percent cut beginning in October. All these things are going to have a tremendous impact upon financial aid of our students. And it's a desperate uh, situation. Dr. Samuel Du Bois Cook, president of Dillard University. We now shift our attention from the administration to members of the student body. Now, while we were here, Sonia Massengale had a chance to talk at length with four of them. Let's start with Carolyn. Tell us why you chose Dillard over all of the other schools that you could have chosen. Well, when I was making my decision uh, about a college to attend, I knew that I was interested in nursing. And Dillard, uh, I had heard so much about Dillard's nursing program. It had such a tremendous reputation. And so I wanted to follow that. I wanted to find out what it was all about. So when I applied to Dillard and during our orientation, I was really pleased by the, the hospitality, by the, um, you know, the enormous excitement about a college and about a program that I just wanted to explore more about it. And now that I've entered, uh, you know, I'm in the program now, I'm a junior. I would not trade this experience for anything. It is, I would say, one of the best 
uh, nursing programs in the United States. It provides you not only with the academics, but um, a lot of uh, human support. You know, when you need help with uh, certain subjects, you may be having problems or personal problems, your instructors are there for you and it's on a one-to-one -one basis, so it, it, it enhances your uh, learning when you can speak with someone on a one-to-one -one basis about your problems, but it is an excellent program, and I'm really glad that I, I chose it. What does it take for a student to achieve success here at Dillard? I think success at Dillard is measured by the individual student's own motivation, his own drive, his desire to excel. Um, Everything that one needs to excel is placed before you here at Dillard. You've got excellent instructors, excellent facilities. Um, things are open to you at all times. It's just a matter of whether or not you really want to do it. If you decide that you want to be the best that you can possibly be, then there's nothing here that will hold you back at all. As student body president, what kind of support do you get from the administration? I think the administration has been very receptive to my administration. Now, there had been some problems with previous administrations as far as the communication between student government and the Dillard University hierarchy, but I think that my administration and I made it a point to go about things the right way from the beginning, opening all the lines of communication and trying to keep everyone aware of what we were doing our purpose for doing it. And through that, we've achieved a large measure of success. We really have. I've been, I've been pleasantly surprised by the amount of cooperation that we've gotten thus far. Hazel, you spent a year abroad studying. How did your experiences at Dillard prepare you for that? Well, being an English major, I think, made it a lot easier to adjust to the system. Because at this school that I went to, the University of Kent in Canterbury, um, I actually took English courses and because the curriculum was pretty much on the same scale, you know, we were studying um, English poets and writers and um, I got a better perspective of it on just by listening to the instructors from England as opposed to my instructors here because they are more in tune with um, the actual history behind all the literature. And I feel that um, perhaps the coursework I did here, especially so far as the, um, the compositions that I would have to write and the essays dealing with the history of English literature, I was able to get a, a pretty good overall perspective of my major. Robert, you've developed a special computer program for elementary school students. Tell us about it. I came up with the idea when I was uh, doing some tutoring at uh, Gregory uh, Junior High School. And uh, the kids were telling me about, you know, they didn't have any knowledge about computers and things of that sort. So knowing that, I, I, I took it on myself and uh, took a lot of initiative, sat down, wrote a proposal, uh, organized it, and um, got with the Pi Delta Mathematics Club, which I was already a member of, and suggested to them that uh, we sponsor our computer science seminar, or we sponsor our computer science seminar, rather. And so that's what we did. Um, last year, when we sponsored it, we had um, about 100 kids, uh, mainly eighth graders from uh, Gregory Junior High School. And uh, from there, we brought them over to Dillard University. Dillard has, uh, at that time, they had access to about maybe 70 or 80 computers that we could use. And so what we did was we didn't try to uh, teach, uh, you know, make the kids uh, computer geniuses and one day know. What we tried to do was uh, get them uh, orientated to a computer, make them, uh, let them know that this is nothing, you know, they shouldn't be afraid of anything like that, we, or, you know, and try to give them some type of uh, computer literacy as possible, you know. Um, and so that's basically what we tried to do. Well. From there, we decided, okay, uh, it came around again, and we said, well, this year, let's do the same thing, but let's expand it and take it to the elementary schools. And so this year, we had close to about 130 kids. 
Drama is an important part of the liberal arts experience for a student here at Dillard. Everyone, administrators, students, and faculty, pulls together to make the production a success. Florence Lyons is the chairman of the drama department. She spoke to us about the program. Well, I've been here for two years. The, the first year, um, we had to take some time to really build it up because they went a year without really a, a drama director. And so after that, I think we got more participation as far as the students trying out for the productions and also as far as the students coming to view the plays. So I'm pretty much satisfied with it. Um, you, you certainly can't get too much participation, so in the years to come, I'm hoping to get even more. Who can participate in the productions here? Any of the students here on Dillard's campus that are interested, uh, surprisingly enough, not just the drama students try out for the plays, but in fact, most of the students that participate in the plays are not drama majors, but come from, from other majors that are simply interested in drama. And uh, not just students that perform in the plays, but also we encourage students to perform backstage with scenery, makeup, costuming, those things. And I constantly tell the students that that's just as important as being out there in front of an audience. But the crew is just as important as the actors and actresses in front of the audience. Could you tell us something about the play? Sure. Um, the play has three main characters. One character is Mrs. Love, and that's played by Sandra Waters. Mrs. Love is a 75-year-old woman that has a grandson. And the play takes place during the 60s. She works for a bigoted sheriff, Sheriff Morrison. The grandson is a little perturbed with her. And the grandson is Eugene, played by Daryl Murray. Um, the grandson, Eugene, is upset with her simply because she continues to work for this bigoted sheriff. But at the same time, she seems to be very sympathetic towards the black movement. They're getting ready to form a sit-in at the local drugstore, a segregated drugstore. And so throughout the play, she tries to let Eugene know that she has made a contribution to the black race. And it's not until the end of the play we find out what a great contribution it is. Grandma, they served us and didn't a soul do a thing. We've immigrated. Well, tell me about it. But when I got there, every white person in the county was on that street. They had clubs and, and iron pipes. And there was dogs in fire trucks with hoses. Well, anyway, when we reached the drugstore, old man Thomas was standing there in the doorway. What y'all want, he said. Service, someone said. That's when the crowd started yelling and making nasty remarks, but none of us moved an inch. That's when the sheriff came down the street from his office. He didn't cuss none? He swore up and down. He walked up to me and said, Boy, what turn the mother niggas want grind here? Freedom, baby, I told him. Freedom my behind, he said. Y'all better get on back where y'all belong and stop acting up before I sick these dogs on you. We ain't leaving till we've been served, I told him. He looked at me in complete amazement. Then he belched and started foaming at the mouth. He was mad, Grandma. He said he'd die before a nigga said where a white woman's behind had been. God is my witness, he said. May I die before I see this place in the grave. Then he took out his whistle. And he put it to his lips, but before he could muster up the breath to blow him, fell to the ground. He rolled himself into a tight ball, cussing and moaning and thrashing around. Then the foaming at the mouth got worse, and he puked, a bloody puke. And his eyes looked like they was going to come out their very sockets. Then he opened his mouth and gasped for breath. Well, in excitement, some of the boys went on into the store, and the girl at the counter says, Y'all can have anything y'all want. Just don't put a curse on me. <laughs> While black faces feel that color, someone from outside yelled, Sheriff Morrison is dead. How do you know so much? You weren't there. Well, no, I wasn't, but I've seen it. I've seen it before. What? Death in the room. Mm -hmm. Old Dr. Crawford's entire family went that way. Some easier and quicker than others, depending. Depending on what? How they loved and treated their fellow neighbor. Namely me. Grandma, what's in that bag you're fumbling with? Spice. You're lying to me. What is it? The spice of life, baby. Did you do something to Sheriff Morrison? <laughs> Grandma, what did you do to Sheriff Morrison? I helped y'all integrate in my own way. What did you do to that man? I gave him peace. I sent him to meet his maker in flying colors. 
tore out his very guts with my special season. Grave me. Calling me nigga. Beating on my men folk. But why? Because I'm a tired old woman who's been tired. Who ain't never had no place and ain't got no place in this society. You talk about the new Negro? I was a new Negro 76 years ago. Don't you think I wanted to sip on me a nice cold Coca-Cola when I went shopping? Don't you think I wanted to hold a decent job so I could feed and clothe my family properly? I resented being called girl and auntie by folks who wasn't even good as me. I worked for nigger haters, made them love me, put my boy through college and sent him to meet them making flying cars. And I got no regrets, boy. Just peace of mind and satisfaction. And I don't need no psychiatrist. I done vented my pent up emotions. Ain't that what you always say? But you could be sent to the electric chair. Who? Auntie Grace Love. Good old black auntie. <laughs> Shoot. I know white folks, boy. And I've been at this for a long time. They know I know my place. Oh, Grandma. Cheer up, son. I've done what I did for you all. And if you don't appreciate it, why don't you ask some of those other young colored boys out there who ain't never been to college? And who felt old man Morrison's whip upside their head? They'd appreciate it. Literation. Like the Underground Railroad. Harry Tubman, that's me. Except I ain't going down in history. Now you take off them clothes before you get them wrinkled up. Where are you going? To shed a tear for the deceased and to get me a train ticket. You going home to daddy? Your daddy don't need me. He's got your mother. No, I ain't going home to your dad. Then where you going? Wasn't you the one telling me about them, them college students sitting here in Mississippi, but they weren't making much leeway because of the sheriff? Or even the governor? Well, I think I'm going to take a trip on down to Mississippi and see what's happening. You wouldn't by any chance know the governor's name, would you? What? I think he might be needing a good cook right now. Grandma! Now you take off the clothes. And while I'm downtown, I'm gonna have me a nice ice cold Sunday soda at Mr. Thomas's. Well, Lord, ain't much left. I wonder who'll be next. Maybe I should put an ad in the newspaper. Who knows? Where he leads me, I shall follow. Now, music is also an important part of the curriculum here at Dillard University. Just ask Dr. Herman Taylor, the university organist and a professor of music. Dr. Taylor, why don't we start about talking about the music program here at Dillard University. What can you tell us about that? Well, we offer the music major for the individual who's interested primarily in performing at Straight Applied, and then we offer music education in uh, voice, piano, organ, various instruments except for stringed instruments. And we have a cooperative music program with Loyola University whereby we offer the music therapy degree. I understand last fall that uh, you were the focus of a lot of attention in conjunction with Bach, uh, sort of a Bach marathon going from country to country. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, last year, well, actually, be actually beginning in the uh, fall of 1984, I embarked on a series of 17 recitals which took me across this country and in uh, four countries in Europe, Western Europe, in which I performed all of the uh, organ works uh, of J.S. Bach. 1985 being the tricentennial year of his birth. And uh, the entire series comprised 246 compositions. How did that come about for you? Well, it was just something that I decided to do in 1978. Uh, Bach's one of my favorite composers and the landmark composer for the pipe organ. And I wanted to do something special to commemorate uh, the memory of this very, very great man and this great composer. And at first, I thought I had the idea of getting together the fine organists in the city. But I thought then that that was going to involve a lot of bickering, 
this person would want to play that composition and another person would want, would want to play it also. So I had time, I decided to do it myself. So what selection by Bach are you going to perform for us today? Well, I thought I'd play a little bit of uh, Bach's signature composition for the organ. I don't need to tell you what it is. When you hear it, you'll know it. Well, that's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. Our thanks to Jinx Broussard and everyone here at Dillard for making our visit an enjoyable one. Next week, folks will be visiting Southern University and Baton Rouge, and we hope that you can join us then. Until that time, make it a good week. Bye-bye. Folks is celebrating its fifth year on LPB, and to celebrate the occasion, we have had designed a five-year commemorative poster. Now, if you are interested in having one, write us and let us know. Send your inquiry to folks in care of Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 and Selmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. We'll be sure to get one off to you right away.